What's up, dogs? Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmidt, and today we're going to be looking at Existential Inertia, a user's guide. Now, before getting into the lecture itself, it's useful to get an overview of the contents of the lecture. So, first of all, my purpose is twofold. I first want to bring greater clarity, precision, and rigor to discussions concerning persistence and explanations of persistence, and perhaps more importantly, I also want to elevate the discourse concerning persistence, existential inertia, arguments for and against God's existence, and the dialectical context in which existential inertia arises. All too often I see uh, lots of misunderstandings on either side, and misunderstandings not only of the thesis itself, existential inertia that is, and the dialectical contexts that characterize the, the discussion. So, uh, with that in mind, the first thing that we're going to be covering uh, is, of course, the dialectical context, or at least the, the various dialectical contexts uh, in which uh, existential inertia as a thesis arises. And then secondly, we're going to be turning to the existential inertia thesis, or EIT, and we're going to be looking at various different formulations and understandings of existential inertia. Third, we're going to be looking at different competing theses, the two foremost of which are Existential Expiration Thesis, or EET, and the Theistic, or perhaps Classical Theistic Sustenance Thesis, or TST, or CTST. I think that's what I called it later on. And then the fourth one is uh, we're going to be looking at metaphysical accounts, and it's actually just going to be a sort of brief sketch. These are metaphysical accounts that try to pinpoint that in virtue of which existential inertia might obtain in reality, if it does so obtain. And so uh, we're going to be looking at some failures, so some accounts that just don't work. We're going to be looking at three different sketches of metaphysical accounts of existential inertia. So let's dig into the dialectical context. So some of you might not be familiar with what a dialectical context is, and for those of you who are familiar, it's useful to get a deeper uh, understanding of what precisely it is. A dialectical context is essentially the conversational environment or circumstances surrounding an argument or issue. Uh, it's relevant to the standards of evidence, the burdens of proof, the questions begged, the role of different reasons that one can, uh, you know, adduce, and, and so on. So one kind of dialectical context might be, for instance, like a mathematician uh, publishing in a peer-reviewed mathematics journal. Like, that is a, is a kind of environment or circumstance surrounding various issues, and it's going to have different standards of evidence than, for instance, a court case on a murder, right? Different reasons will be accepted. You're, you're not going to be able to appeal to, you know, experience. Usually you're going to have to appeal to formal, rigorous mathematical methods uh, of proof and deduction and so on. Uh, but by contrast, there are different standards of evidence in different uh, dialectical context. So for instance, in the court case, you're going to have different standards of evidence. You're going to be able to bring in eyewitness testimony. That's something that you wouldn't be able to have in the mathematics journal. And it also establishes burdens of proof. In a court case, the, the person who has the primary burden of proof is the one who wants to establish guilt, right? And so burden of proof also varies from context to context. It depends on who's, who started making the assertions. It depends on uh, the views at play, whether one of them might be uh, much more intuitive than the other. So if we think that it's pretty obvious that we have hands or we think that you know, if we're phenomenal conservativists, we might think that it's seeming to be the case, provides evidence for something's being the case. And so if it seems to us that we have hands, then, you know, we have evidence for us having hands. What this does is it actually kind of uh, creates a dialectical context wherein the burden of proof is actually on the skeptic. You know, they actually have the role to positively demonstrate or at least give us reasons or defeaters for our defeasible presumption in favor of for instance, the existence of hands or the existence of the, an external world. And so dialectical contexts are immensely important, and they can determine uh, when a question is begged, uh, you know, what are the role of, of reasons, what kind of reasons, they're relevant to the standards of evidence, and so on. Uh, applying this to existential inertia, right? I mean, here are at least four important dialectical contexts. I'm, of course, not claiming that these are the only ones or the only ones that are important, but these are at least four important ones. 
So one of them is actually in the context of an argument for God's existence. So in this case, a, a theist or a classical theist is going to be trying to give positive reasons for thinking that God exists. Now, existential inertia can actually crop up in such dialectical contexts as either an undercutting or rebutting defeater. And what that means is that it's not necessarily the case that in such contexts, uh, the existential inertialist has a burden of proof or burden of justification because he or she could simply be posing existential inertia as an undercutting defeater. Uh, in other words, uh, the person could be, you know, could pinpoint a certain premise in the original argument for God's existence, say, hey, this premise, you know, assumes that things don't persist in existence without requiring a sustaining cause. But, you know, what if this existential inertia case, which seems not obviously incoherent, what if that were the case? And so they're, they're going to pose that. And so the person who's leveling the positive argument, who needs to convince those who, who don't already agree with their position, they're going to have to be the ones who give positive reasons for thinking that existential inertia uh, is false or couldn't be the case, at least within such dialectical contexts of an argument for God's existence, right? And so, uh, you know, the existential inertialist is well within his or her epistemic rights not to demonstrate the truth of existential inertia, because that's not, that's not what is required to at least provide an undercutting defeater, right? For an undercutting defeater, all you need to do is pinpoint some uh, unjustified assumption or give a, you know, seemingly coherent alternative uh, to a theory or a position or a premise in question, it, it serves to remove the justification for the original argument. And so what that means is that all one has to do, right, all one has to do is, and so someone can simply mount existential inertia as an undercutting defeater, as showing that the argument the positive argument that is aimed to demonstrate God's existence doesn't adequately rule out existential inertia or doesn't um, show it to be false. And hence, it could just be used as a tool for pinpointing an unjustified assumption or presupposition of a particular argument. Clearly, this is a different, this is a different context from other ones that might actually mean that existential inertia has a burden of proof to justify, positively justify it. Whereas in some other contexts, it's perfectly legitimate for it not to have a burden of proof precisely because the burden of proof is on the person giving or attempting to give a positive demonstration of God's existence, one of whose premises assumes the falsity of existential inertia. Uh, and, you know, it's slightly different with a rebutting defeater. So a rebutting defeater is aimed, of course, to show an argument or a premise uh, or a conclusion to be false. And in that case, existential inertia would definitely have a burden of proof if one is leveling it as a rebutting defeater of a of an argument or premise or conclusion. A second dialectical context is as a standalone thesis. So just considering existential inertia on its own, asking whether or not it's justified, whether or not it's true or false, and so on. And so that oftentimes is going to require a burden of proof. A third dialectical context is one wherein you're doing a sort of global theoretical comparison. Now, in this case, all you need to do is fend off the principal objections to it, or, of course, show that the principal objections to it are such that they are sufficiently outweighed by the theoretical virtues that accrue to existential inertia, or perhaps a worldview in which existential inertia is true. Again, there will be different standards of evidence for this kind of context, right? Because you're doing a global theoretical comparison. So you're actually just looking at theoretical virtues and theoretical vices. You're going to be looking at simplicity, you know, explanatory power, explanatory breadth and depth, uh, unification, uh, and all sorts of different, you know, explanatory and theoretical virtues. And that's going to be different than, for instance, a context in which you're simply leveling existential inertia as an undercutting defeater. And it's also going to be different, different from a context in which you're uh, trying to positively demonstrate existential inertia. Because if you're simply doing a global theoretical comparison, you don't need to positively demonstrate it. You can simply show that its explanatory or theoretical virtues are better than its main rival alternatives, right? Uh, and so this is yet another dialectical context. And then the fourth dialectical context is one wherein you're simply doing a kind of inference to the best explanation. So we have certain data, namely that things persist in existence, and we want to see, well, what best explains that? And so we put a bunch of different hypotheses on offer, and we try to pinpoint which hypothesis best explains uh, the data in question. And again, you're probably going to be appealing to various explanatory virtues, similar to the sort of theoretical virtues uh, 
you know, incorporated within a worldview that we were discussing in that third dialectical context. And so why do I bring all this up? Well, it's extremely important because so many times online, you will be in a dialectical context wherein someone else is trying to, for instance, prove God's existence. And someone, and then another person will bring up, well, hey, this particular premise, uh, you know, it assumes the falsity of existential inertia, but you know, why think that? Like, what reason do you have for demonstrating the falsity of existential inertia? You can't have an argument that assumes its falsity. What reason do you have for thinking that? And then I have seen oftentimes that the, the person who was originally p putting forward the argument, they sort of shift the burden of proof and they say, well, hold on a second. Like, why would you believe existential inertia? No, that question misses, misunderstands the dialectical context. The onus of justification is not on the existential inertia quote unquote proponent in this case, precisely because all they're doing is trying to pinpoint an underlying assumption of the argument that is left unjustified. It is not up to them to positively prove that uh, that thesis, rather, uh, you know, unless, of course, they claim that, you know, either they could prove it or that it's true. Rather, all they're doing in such a context is simply offering it as an undercutting defeater for the argument. And hence, the onus of justification would actually be on the person who's trying to mount an argument for God's existence, one of whose premises presupposes the falsity of existential inertia. And hence, their question would actually be ill-formed. It'd be dialectically ill-situated. That's the main reason why I included this. It's really to help give greater clarity and precision and rigor, as I, as I said in the beginning, in debates concerning ex existential inertia and what relevant standards of evidence and burdens of proof and questions begged uh, are going to be coming up in different dialectical contexts. We can now move on to basically just spelling out the thesis itself. And so the rough idea is that, well, there is a kind of inertial continuance or persistence in existence. Uh, inertial, something is behaves inertially, right? But that just means that it sort of retains its condition without a kind of continual uh, causal sustenance of such a condition. It sort of uh, retains that condition of its own accord. And so the thesis in very rough terms states roughly that, you know, temporal concrete things or some subset of them continue in existence of their own accord, you know, that is without requiring a sort of continuously concurrent sustaining or conserving cause of their existence. Roughly, X is a sustaining cause of Y's existence, provided that Y's existence causally depends on X's causal activity at any moment at which Y exists, and uh, moreover, X's moment-by-moment -moment causal activity is a necessary condition for Y's moment-by-moment -moment existence. So I've given the rough idea, and now let's get into various different theses of existential inertia, right? These are going to vary uh, concerning their domain of quantification, right? Like, do they quantify over everything? Do they quantify only over concrete objects? Do they quantify only uh, over fundamental concrete objects? Um, and, you know, it, again, this is going to be very relevant to discussions concerning existential inertia, because some proposed quote-unquote counterexamples are not even going to be targeting the thesis itself if the thesis is simply that fundamental concrete objects persist in existence without requiring a sustaining cause. My main point here is just to say that the particular thesis, the existential inertia thesis, they vary, right? They vary in, the, in their domain of quantification. They vary in, you know, the fundamentality of the things over which they quantify. It all depends on which particular thesis uh, you are targeting or which particular thesis is central to your conversational context. So the first thesis here that I have is the global thesis, which just says that everything inertially persists, right? Um, you know, the objects, events, properties, states of affairs, anything that has positive reality, some kind of positive ontological item, it's just going to persist without requiring some sort of sustaining cause. Okay, that's what that thesis says. And I, I don't defend this thesis. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone that does defend it. We might think that processes, you know, processes are a sort of um, ongoing activity, uh, various causal powers and various entities interacting in certain ways, this kind of ongoing activity, we might think that processes sort of, of their very nature, uh, have sustaining causes. I mean, that, that process is like, it's something that various things do, either by themselves or in concert with one another, right? And so we might think that just to be a process is to be something that is sustained by the causal operations of the various things that make up the process, right? And so uh, it seems very unclear uh, that processes could inertially persist. So the global thesis is, it's a bit odd and 
uh, we can just set that aside for now. Um, I don't defend it. No one else I know of defends it. So the second kind of thesis is an entitative thesis. An entitative, that just means of or pertaining to entities, of course. Uh, so like concrete objects. So things like amoebas and particles and photons and galaxies and earth and substance, you know, just like objects, not like events, not states of affairs, not properties of things. And so this entitative thesis restricts inertial persistence. Uh, it only makes claims, I should say, concerning concrete objects and their inertial persistence. And so a sort of global entitative thesis, we might say, uh, quantifies over both fundamental and non-fundamental concrete objects that they, that they inertially persist. And so a, a fundamental concrete object is something that we might think is sort of at the at the base or foundational layer of reality. It doesn't have any more fundamental elements, you know, composing it. So we might think that, for instance, quarks are are at the fundamental layer of at least physical reality. I mean, if you're if you're a theist, you might think that God, for instance, is at the fundamental layer, as it were, uh, of reality. That's not to say that God constitutes other things. So there are a variety of different relations that we might think obtain between the fundamental and the non-fundamental. One is a kind of constitution relation. Another one is a grounding relation. Grounding is a kind of non-causal explanation, uh, and so on, right? But hopefully you get roughly the idea of fundamental and non-fundamentals. That's the sort of entitative thesis. It quantifies both over fundamental and non-fundamental non things. So basically all concrete objects, they inertially persist. Uh, and then another thesis that's, you know, decently, decently respectable, uh, and that kind of makes sense, is fundamental entitative thesis. And this says that fundamental concrete objects inertially persist. So it makes no claims about non-fundamental things. For all this says, a variety of non-fundamental concrete objects could easily require sustaining causes. Um, you know, humans might require sustaining causes for their existence. Um, and what the fundamental entitative thesis is probably going to want to say is that the fundamental concrete objects inertially persist, and they're the ones that account for, either by constitution, or by grounding, or by sustaining causation, they're the ones that account for the non-fundamental persistence, uh, or the, the persistence of non-fundamental concrete objects, right? And so, in this case, we actually do have some sustaining causation, or at least perhaps some kind of sustaining grounding or, or constitution, uh, but the most fundamental things right? Whether they be quarks or whether they be, you know, protons or whether they be uh, a single quantum field, or maybe it's a neutral monist stuff, or maybe it's a, a necessarily existent mind that is a temporal mind that persists without requiring a sustaining cause. Um, whatever it be at that fundamental layer uh, of reality, uh, according to this thesis, that initially persists and that thing accounts for the persistence of non-fundamental things. And so this thesis is actually com perfectly compatible with sustaining causes. Um, it's just that it's going to kind of bottom out in something that is fundamental and that inertially persists. And uh, this kind of bridges into the next thing that's really relevant to questions concerning inertial persistence and its necessary existence. So something's being metaphysically necessary. So there are some important implications and complications that arise when we consider necessary existence. So recall that I characterized existential inertia as things as persistence or continuance, or at least temporal things as uh, persistence or continuance in existence, without having some, you know, extrinsic sustaining cause of their existence moment after moment after moment, right? This does have some complications if we think that, for instance, uh, the bottom layer of reality like, let's just focus on a kind of neoclassical theistic god, right? Uh, such a god is going to be a temporal thing, right? It's going to persist. But yet it's not going to have some sort of sustaining cause of its existence. And so in some sense, existential inertia, as I've defined it, is going to be applying to the uh, neoclassical theistic god, right? It is in some sense going to have inertial persistence insofar as that persists in existence or it continues in to exist and it is a temporal thing. Uh, without requiring some sort of extrinsic sustaining cause that, you know, concurrently holds it in being or whatever. It, it might seem a little odd to speak in terms of, uh, you know, a necessary foundation having existential inertia. But, you know, perhaps, perhaps it's actually, you know, a benefit. Maybe its existential inertia is kind of undergirded by its necessary existence, such that its uh, 
its inertial persistence is actually explained in virtue of its necessary existence, right? So the neoclassical theistic God, for instance, is going to persist without a sustaining cause precisely because, number one, right, it has necessary existence, so it's not going to sort of come into being or go out of being, right? And so, of course, necessarily it's going to persist. And it's also temporal, right? I mean, it's a temporal God. Thirdly, it is the sort of uh, ground of all other realities, right? The neoclassical theistic God is precisely that in virtue of which any other thing can come to be, right? Uh, the neoclassical theistic God is that which creates every non-God concrete object, uh, and that in virtue of which they are possible. They all uh, derive from this being. And so we actually get a, a really neat explanation of inertial persistence if we kind of adopt uh, a neoclassical theistic view. Uh, this will be a kind of fundamental entitative existential inertia, and it's that plus necessary existence, but it gives us a kind of explanation for uh, the inertial persistence of uh, the single fundamental entity on such a view, namely God, right? He necessarily exists, and he can't have some kind of sustaining cause of his necessary existence because he's precisely the source of every uh, non-God concrete object uh, apart from him. And note that this wouldn't actually solely apply to a neoclassical theistic god, right? We might think that the necessary foundation uh, of reality is kind of uh, is matter or energy, or perhaps it's a collection of physically non-composite fundamental particles, for example, quarks and electrons. Or we might think that it's a single quantum field. Uh, or we might think that, that it's a kind of neutral monist substance, or, or whatever, right? It, it, that leaves it open. The accounts of existential inertia that I give, a lot of these leave it open whether or not the fundamental layer of things that have inertial persistence uh, are necessarily existent. My account also leaves it open that they might be contingent. And it also leaves open, for the most part, the relation between the fundamental layer and the non-fundamental layer. It allows there to be sustaining causes there. It allows there to be no sustaining causes, but perhaps a constitution relation, or a grounding relation, or what have you. So my thesis is, is perfectly compatible with less fundamental contingent things, for instance, or at least the theses that I've given, the variety of different theses, right? Uh, it's perfectly compatible with some of those perhaps inertially persisting. Maybe some of them actually require sustaining causes in terms of more fundamental things that themselves inertially persist and so on. Or perhaps um, the, you know, the fundamental thing has necessary existence and it inertially persists. And perhaps it doesn't sustain less fundamental things and those things inertially persist, but still perhaps maybe they are grounded in or constituted by the, the necessarily existent foundation. The accounts that I've been spelling out they leave open a lot, which is which is really good. It leaves open a lot of different views of the uh, relation between the fundamental and the non-fundamental. It leaves open the contingency or the necessity of the fundamental uh, and non-fundamental, and so on, right? And so what this what also this goes to show is that in discussions concerning ex existential inertia, again, you need to specify the thesis that you're talking about. Are you talking about the global thesis that you want to criticize or you want to prove? Or are you talking about the entitative thesis? Are you talking about the fundamental entitative thesis? thesis? Are you also targeting a fundamental entitative thesis that incorporates necessary existence at the foundation? And so on, right? Oftentimes I see discussions of existential inertia and it's like, it's like performing surgery with an axe. I mean, it's, it's, there, we need so much more precision, right? What particular thesis are you talking about? You need to get clear on the dialectical context. Uh, who is the burden of proof? What are the standards of evidence? And so on. Um, you know, are we doing a global theoretical comparison? Uh, so that's something you need to get clear on as we've discussed. Second, of all, you need to get clear on the pre precise thesis. Are we talking about the global thesis, where it's everything? Are we talking about the entitative thesis, where it's just concrete objects, um, both fundamental and non-fundamental? Are we instead talking about the fundamental entitative thesis, that fundamental concrete objects inertially persist? Or are we talking about the fundamental entitative thesis plus the necessary existence of the foundation, of the temporal foundation, that is, that persists inertially? It is so important to keep all of these in mind when you're thinking of persistence and so on. Something else that my account leaves open, or at least tries to leave open, I mean, I want to explore the relationship between them further, but it tries to leave open uh, endurantism and perdurantism. So I'll, I'll generally speak in endurantist terms because that's kind of the intuitive way that we speak. I try to leave open the metaphysics of persistence. So for those of you who don't know, there are roughly and broadly two different competing accounts or theses concerning the metaphysics of persistence of objects through time. So according to endurantism, which is usually concomitant with presentism, objects have only spatial dimensions. 
and they, they are wholly present at any point in time during their lifetime, right? So uh, I am wholly present right now, and then I'm going to be wholly present in five seconds. I'm not sort of an extended four-dimensional worm, as it were. Objects are also viewed from the present, right? The default is that statements are true now. And finally, objects don't have temporal parts. They don't have sort of uh, extended pieces of them, uh, you know, through time. Perdurantism, of course, is basically the kind of like the opposite of this. Usually it's concomitant with a kind of eternalism, uh, and it says that objects have both spatial and temporal dimensions. So not only do we, uh, not only are we three-dimensional creatures, but we're also four-dimensional creatures. We have a spatial dimension, uh, uh, you know, along which we are extended creatures. Uh, we also, uh, at any given time, uh, we are only partially present there, right? It's only a temporal part of us, or a temporal slice of us that is present there, right? The whole of us, as it were, is the 4D object, right? Extended throughout time. And so we're never wholly present at a particular moment. It's just a sort of a portion of us, as it were, or a parcel of us. And we're only partially present there. Objects from the past, present, and future all exist. That's kind of the uh, eternalism commitment, as it were. And then objects extend in time as well as space. And they have temporal parts as well as spatial parts, according to this perdurantist view. And then here's a kind of, I guess, visual illustration of it. Of course, these are about temporal ontology, but they do kind of show the persistence. So on the bottom, you can kind of see that it's like, it's sort of like a worm, as it were, you know, it's like a, and it's an extended thing. So these are actually three spatial, spatial dimensions right here. And then the, the, the block is kind of like the time dimension. So you can imagine that this is like a three dimensional object going through time, thereby making it a four dimensional object, right? So like this is the object, like this is a single object. These aren't successive states of wholly distinct objects. This is one single object. It's the four dimensional object extended through time, right? And at each of these moments, uh, the object is not wholly present there, right? It's only partially present there. This is a, just a mere temporal part of it. Whereas over here, this is the whole object. It is wholly present here. It is not extended throughout time. So just for the purposes of this video, uh, I will you know, precisify the existential inertia thesis as follows. Uh, this is just the kind of global entitative thesis. So I'm applying it to both uh, in this in this particular formulation, just for simplicity's sake, I'm just applying it number one, to concrete objects, temporal concrete objects. Number two, whether or not they are fundamental or non fundamental. And this account right that, that I'm talking about right now leaves it open as to whether some of them are contingent or necessary. I'm not sure which one I find more plausible, the global entitative thesis or the fundamental entitative thesis, but for purposes here, I'm just going to leave that open. This one says that temporal concrete objects continue or persist in existence once in existence without requiring a continuously concurrent sustaining cause of their existence and cease to exist only if caused, whether by internal or external factors, to do so. Whew. Now, there are, of course, different competing theses, you know, that compete with existential inertia that are incompatible with it. Among others, there are two kind of central ones that, uh, that you need to know about um, in order to sort of think critically about existential inertia. That's kind of the goal of this video is to at least help you think, criti think critically about existential inertia. So the first one is the existential expiration thesis. So this just says temporal concrete objects instantaneously cease to exist in the absence of a continuously concurrent sustaining cause of their existence and persist in existence only if efficiently causally sustained or conserved in existence. And so if you like look at my formulation of existent of EIT, right, this is kind of like an exact parallel, right? It's kind of, it's parallel to it, but it's like basically it's, it's opposite, right? So where the other one talks about persistence, this one talks about, um, you know, instantaneous cessation of existence and vice versa, really. And then the second thesis that's relevant here is what I've called the classical theistic sustenance thesis, or CTST, which says, number one, EET is true, right? So it's committed to EET, and then it adds another thing, namely two, a necessary condition for temporal objects to avoid existential expiration at T is God's efficient causal sustenance ex nihilo. So turning now to the metaphysical accounts of existential inertia, or at least sketches of metaphysical accounts, um, I guess it's important to, well, I guess specify what a metaphysical account is, right? So metaphysical accounts of existential inertia attempt to pinpoint that in virtue of which EIT obtains, of course, if it attains at all, at all right? Um, such an account is clearly crucial not only to avert obvious criticisms of existential inertia, but also to serve as a tool for avoiding more sophisticated criticisms, since some such criticisms only apply to one metaphysical account and not others. 
or perhaps no, none of the predominant metaphysical accounts on offer, right? And hence, it's incumbent on detractors of existential inertia not only to rule out one such account, but each such account, right? Um, yeah, so that's definitely the, the first thing that I want to mention uh, concerning the metaphysical accounts. The second thing is that, it, you know, it's worth noting two failed metaphysical accounts of existential inertia, okay? According to the first account, existential inertia is a sort of power or capacity of things. Now this account, in my estimation, fails because powers or capacities plausibly inhere in, and hence presuppose the prior reality of, substances, right? Or objects, rather. But then such a power or capacity cannot account for the moment-by-moment -moment existence or persistence of its, of its object, right? Since the very power or capacity in question already presupposes, as it were, the moment-by-moment -moment reality of the substance in which it inheres, right? Now, a second account that, you know, by my estimation fails, uh, holds that existential inertia is kind of a, it's like a property that things come to exemplify when they come into existence. Now, as before, this account seems to fail on account of presupposing the very thing, right, it's aimed to account for, namely the prior moment-by-moment -moment reality of the substance or object, precisely because that is what is required in order for the object to exemplify the, the property in question. Now this will probably depend on our metaphysics of, of properties and how we conceive of the exemplification relation. So you, this second account, uh, it's, it's only a failure under some versions of the exemplification relation. At least be wary of these particular accounts of existential inertia and why they, uh, you know, plausibly don't succeed. So uh, there are, however, more promising metaphysical accounts to work with, and so um, I'll just outline three here, but there are, of course, others. So the first one runs roughly, uh, we can call it the earlier account, and it says that for each non-first time t at which temporal concrete object S exists, S's existence at t is explained by the conjunction of 1, the state and existence of S at the time immediately prior to t, and 2, the absence of any sufficiently destructive causal factors from the immediately prior time through and including t. Now the relevant account of explanation, it's neutral on it, whether we kind of want to take a sort of primitivist account where explanation might be, um, there might be certain paradigm examples of explanation and some perhaps subcategories that are explanatory, but we might think that, you know, explanation is a, is a sort of primitive notion, uh, or we might, you know, conceive of explanation as causation or grounding or some kind of dependence or a whole host of other forms, right? This account leaves it open as to what that, uh, it's neutral on what the type of explanation is at play and what, what account of explanation we give. Um, I just wanted to get that out of the way. The second thing by way of preliminary, right, is that, you know, one might think that this account presupposes that for each time there's an immediately temporally prior time. Um, but of course, if time is continuous as opposed to discrete, right, such that for any two distinct times there are a continuum many times between them, well, then it would simply be false that there exists an immediately temporally prior time, right? So, you know, what, is, what does this account say about that? First, I mean, even if the account works only under discrete time, it would still be significant if there were a workable metaphysical account of existential inertia assuming discrete time. But second of all, the account is not, after all, essentially tied to discrete time, right? Like, I mean, if time is continuous, simply let the temporal state immediately prior to t be some suitably small, perhaps infinitesimally small, non-zero interval of time with t as its later than bound. So we can sort of conceive of it that way. The second thing that I want to say on behalf of this account is that explanations of present things as existence in terms of past things are not only legitimate, but they're often indispensable, right? Like present allelic frequencies in biological populations are explained, at least in part, in terms of past selection pressures and past reproductive behavior. Discursive reasoning processes, that is to say reasoning premise by premise to a conclusion, require not only a justificatory or reason-based link between the past consideration of the premises on the one hand and acceptance of the conclusion on the other, but also they require a causal or explanatory link between one's previous consideration of the premises and one's present acceptance of the conclusion. In principle, there seems to be nothing debarring past things from explaining, causally or otherwise, the existence of present things. Okay, so now we can turn to the second account. Now, this second account actually takes its cue from one of Phaser's foremost ways of reconciling mechanical inertia 
that is to say like Newtonian inertia with respect to spatial location or local motion, uh, with an Aristotelian Thomistic principle of causality or principle of motion. Um, that, that principle states that whatever changes, that is to say transitions from potency to act, is changed or actualized by another. Uh, now, you know, we might think that, oh wait, hold, hold on a second, there seem to be clear examples of changes, namely spatial changes going from one spatial position to another, that don't have some sort of causal actualization or change by way of another, right? You know, it kind of just kind of just goes inertially. It just it just things retain their their spatial their rectilinear motion, right? Even in the absence of some sort of external uh, factor that kind of impels them forward, as it were. One might think that that's a counterexample, but Phaser has a variety of different ways of reconciling mechanical inertia with this uh, Aristotelian Thomistic principle, and the foremost reconciliation treats uniform spatial motion as stasis or unchangingness, rather than involving change as a transition from potency to act. So Phaser, for instance, he writes, quote, precisely because the principle of inertia treats uniform local motion as a quote-unquote state, it treats it thereby as the absence of change. In this case, the question of how the principle of motion and the principle of inertia relate to one another does not even arise, for there just is no motion, in the relevant Aristotelian sense, going on in the first place, when all an object is doing is quote-unquote moving inertially in the Newtonian sense. To be sure, acceleration would in this case involve motion in the Aristotelian sense, but as we have seen, since Newtonian physics itself requires a cause for accelerated motion, there is not even a prima facie conflict with an Aristotelian principle of motion." Unquote. So as Phaser points out, right, it seems entirely justifiable to understand uniform spatial motion as a state of stasis or unchangingness. But given this, it seems that we can equally justifiably understand persistence and existence as an absence of change, right? In fact, this seems to be the kind of ordinary common sense understanding of persistence, right? Like remaining or continuing in, continuing in existence is commonly thought not to involve change, but rather the maintenance of a state of actuality, right? We tend to think only that deviations from something's state of non-existence or existence count as a kind of uh, dynamic change or changes either coming into or passing out of being, right? And so we therefore have materials for a second account of existential inertia, right? And it kind and it employs a kind of principle sufficient reason according to which dynamic changes of state require explanations in terms of some extrinsic cause or actualization of such change, whereas the maintenance or non-disruption of a state does not require an explanation in terms of some extrinsic cause which keeps the state non-disrupted or maintained, right? Instead, instead the maintenance or, you know, non-disruption of a state is explained in terms of the very nature of states, you know, as stable, unchanging actual conditions which are retained unless positively disrupted, in conjunction, of course, with there being no such disrupting factors operative. It's worth emphasizing, of course, that this view actually rejects there being any brute facts concerning the moment-by-moment -moment existence of things, right? It does hold that there is an explanation of persistence. It is in terms of, one, an understanding of existential persistence as a state of actuality, as opposed to a dynamic transition from non-being to being at any given moment, two, the very nature of states as a kind of stasis or unchangingness, a la Phaser's account of spatial motion, and three, there being or having been no causal factors that induce deviations from the state in question, namely persistent existence. And thus we get the second account on here. It is called the state account, which says that persistent, persistent existence is a state of unchangingness or stasis. And by their very nature, states of unchangingness deviate from their actual condition only if there is some positive disruption of their condition. The third and uh, final account, right, treats persistent existence, in the absence, of course, of both destructive factors and sustaining causes, as a metaphysically necessary feature of reality. And so we can call it the necessity account. Concrete objects continue in existence once in existence in the absence of a sustaining cause in virtue of this being metaphysically necessary. Now this, of course, does not entail that the objects in question are metaphysically necessary, because it says uh, it's a sort of conditional necessity. If they exist, right, once in existence, then it is necessarily the case that, so long as there are no sufficiently destructive causal factors operative, 
they necessarily persist in existence, right? Uh, and so, you know, that, that condition might not be met. They might not have been brought into existence in the first place, perhaps. Um, or there might be sufficiently destructive causal factors. But it says that once they're in existence, and provided that there is uh, the absence of such, uh, you know, causal causally, sufficiently causally destructive factors, then we get the sort of metaphysical necessity of existential inertia uh, coming in. And existential inertia is obtaining, right, the metaphysical account of existential inertia that we're using uh, is one that is explained, it's obtaining in reality, uh, if of course it obtains, is explained in virtue of the metaphysical necessity of its obtaining. So it's a kind of metaphysically necessary principle of any reality that has persistent objects. Now, um, you know, what might we say on behalf of this? Well, you know, first, I mean, X is being metaphysically necessary surely provides, or at least can provide, an explanation of why X obtains. Like, right? Like, why do one and one make two? Well, you know, it, it's just metaphysically necessary. And of course, according to many theists, like, why does God exist? Well, because he is a metaphysically necessary being, right? And so on. Now, of course, you know, we don't need to claim here that metaphysical necessity categorically precludes any further explanation. Uh, you know, rather, we're simply just, we can simply just note that metaphysical necessity is itself a kind of explanation of something's obtaining, or at least it can be, right? Persistence, then, under this account, is not left unexplained. Now, of course, there's a further question as to why it's metaphysically necessary. Like, you know, is there some further story to tell? Like, is there something further that accounts for its metaphysical necessity? I don't have time to investigate proposals here, but one account, of course, is to take the foundation as, number one, metaphysically necessary, and number two, necessarily temporal. So we could take a sort of neoclassical theist view. We could take a view according to which the fundamental layer of physical reality, whether it be a quantum field, say, you know, quantum field theory tells us that it's probably quantum fields uh, at the ground layer of reality rather than these discrete, like, atomistic, uh, you know, Democritian atoms. Um, so we could take it to be the, like, a fundamental quantum field that exists of metaphysical necessity, or we could take it to be a kind of neutral monist stuff, right? Uh, we don't have to specify whether it's physical, maybe it has certain uh, qualitative elements like proto-consciousness or, or what have you, whatever, right? We, uh, th that's just one account, you know, that we could give that kind of further uh, fleshes out this, this metaphysical necessity, and hence we could actually get a kind of uh, an explanation even of the necessity of existential inertia. But uh, I also want to say that we can justify treat this necessity as a kind of basic or primitive metaphysical necessity, right? The necessity simply does not obtain in virtue of any more fundamental metaphysical facts. Now, one might think that, oh, well, that violates the PSR. Well, uh, I don't think so, right? I mean, contemporary formulations of the PSR, firstly, are usually restricted to contingent things and, you know, for good reason. Um, I mean, if you want to check out the good reasons, check out uh, Proust's book on the principle of sufficient reason. I mean, one reason for the restriction is that necessary things just simply don't seem to kind of cry out for explanation the way contingent things do, right? Like, contingent things genuinely could have failed to be, and hence there is a kind of puzzlement or mystery as to why they in fact are. Um, and moreover, as Proust, you know, in my view, ably argues, right, we simply don't have an adequate grip on the nature of explanations of necessary things to categorically require explanations of them. Like, consider, for instance, distinct but logically equivalent axiomatizations in mathematics, in which there seem to be no non-arbitrary ways to deem one set of axioms, as opposed to another, explanatorily fundamental, right? Like, oftentimes you can, you can uh, formalize the axioms of, of mathematics in distinct and incompatible ways, and then derive other derive like the other <laughs> axioms, as it were, from distinct, uh, you know, axiomatizations of the fundamental axioms. And so it, it's on, there doesn't seem to be any sort of non-arbitrary way to pick out which one of these is actually the more fundamental set of axioms than the other. Um, that's not to say there isn't, there's no way in principle, but it's very difficult to see a non-arbitrary way when you have um, logically equivalent axiomatizations or even um, distinct distinct axiomatizations uh, from which you can derive lots of the uh, the other axioms and so on. So that's that's one reason why it plausibly doesn't violate the PSR, because again, the PSRs are usually restricted to contingent things and for good reason. But second of all, I mean, every explanatory account of existential persistence will bottom out in some form of primitive or basic metaphysical necessity, uh, right? That is to say, a metaphysical necessity that's not extrinsically explained by something apart from itself, right? Uh, you know, I mean, if 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 we don't have a, an account, or explanatory account, excuse me, of existential persistence that bottoms out in some form of primitive or metaphysical necessity, primitive or basic metaphysical necessity, then we're going to simply have an infinitely descending chain of more fundamental explanations. Um, and even then, right, I mean, like, there's still the further question of why there is such a chain in the first place, which itself will presumably be a primitive metaphysical necessity. So primitive metaphysical necessities are, in my view, absolutely unavoidable.
Um, and so al alternatively, you know, if one posits that necessity is a kind of self-explanation, thereby avoiding primitivity, well, then the same self-explanation is available in principle for this necessity account, right? And so, you know, we can, at least for the purposes of this video here, uh, you know, we can just leave open which of these accounts is the correct one, right? And we can simply, uh, you know, offer these to advance the dialectic, uh, you know, and really help you guys think critically about existential inertia. So um, by way of criticisms of existential inertia, well, there are two primary ones within the literature, and they're both from Phaser. One of them derives from hylomorphism and the principle of proportionate causality. The other one derives from hylomorphism and vicious circularity, um, among others. Uh, and so I will actually uh, touch on those in a future video. And by future, I don't mean the extended future. I mean, hopefully within the next few weeks or so. Um, I, I will touch on those arguments in a few weeks, um, but uh, that, I'll just save them for that video because this one's getting a little bit long at this point. Um, but in general, for a given argument against existential inertia, what they need to do is, is they need to attack all three accounts and, you know, other accounts because those aren't the only three accounts uh, that I sketched, but they need to attack all three accounts of existential inertia, right? And if the argument is a theistic argument from causal sustenance, it needs to demonstrate CTST and by implication EET. And then, um, yeah, coming soon, right? Uh, this is a, a little foretaste, as it were. Uh, it's a video entitled Existential Inertia and the Aristotelian Proof, based on my IJPR paper. I'm going to cover uh, one criticism of the Aristotelian Proof, namely Existential Inertia, in extended depth. Uh, it's going to be heavily based on my paper. I'm going to be motivating Existential Inertia. I'm going to be pinpointing various theoretical virtues um, and explanatory virtues that it has in relation to other um, uh, the other competing theses. I'm also going to respond to the principal objections to the existential inertia in the literature. And when? Well, I don't quite know. Uh, as I said, it's going to be within the next few weeks or so. Now, uh, if you're a little curious soul and you want to do some further reading, um, I, I, I believe the term existential inertia kind of originated with Mortimer Adler in his 1980 book, How to Think About God. He didn't develop it in much detail. It's kind of it's kind of of historical significance why I put that in there. Um, it's not really it's not really a detailed kind of investigation into existential inertia. Um, I just think he kind of he kind of briefly briefly discusses it and kind of gives it a name. 2007, we've got Bodouin. I think that's how you pronounce it. Maybe it's Bodouin. Um, uh, his 2007 article, The World's Continuance, Divine Conservation or Existential Inertia in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. Uh, and then, so that he gives, maybe he gives a few defenses for existential inertia. He, um, it's kind of a, a preliminary work where he just spells out the thesis and, um, yeah. And then uh, Ed Fazer's 2011 article, Existential Inertia in the Five Ways, he discusses, well, existential inertia in the five ways. Um, he th That's where his two main criticisms, uh, you know, hylomorphism and PPC, and on the other hand, um, hylomorphism and vicious circularity. Uh, that's where he levels those, and he also discusses um, Bodwin's paper. And then Paul Audi, uh, 2019, his paper, Existential Inertia, is absolutely brilliant. It's kind of a, a critical discussion of both sides. He argues that uh, there isn't a successful argument on either side, either for or against existential inertia. He also looks at Fazer's work. He also looks at the metaphysics of time in, in much greater detail than, than I have in this video. And then this last one, I don't even know who this last author is. How do you pronounce that? Schmidt, 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 something. I, I, his name is Joseph. I mean, that's a, that's a ludicrous name. Apparently it's forthcoming. Uh, that's existential inertia in the Aristotelian proof, and that's in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion as well. Yeah, so if you guys know that author, maybe you can, you know, get me in touch with him, because maybe he should come on my channel at some point. Um, and then, oh, this is the end uh, of this particular lecture. So pretty please, uh, I, I want you to like and subscribe and turn on that little bell for notifications. And most importantly, share, share this with your friends. Hopefully this can be edifying to them. Hopefully this can, my main goal in this is not to convince people, right? My main goal in this video is to en enliven and enrich the dialectic. It is to elevate the discussion, to call people higher to call them to critical thinking, to call them to think deeply about the most fundamental questions that plague humanity and our search for truth. So if that's what you're interested in, uh, well then, please like, subscribe, turn on that little bell, and most importantly, share this with your friends. If it's on Instagram, maybe it's on Twitter, maybe it's on TikTok, yes, please make a TikTok video wherein you are advocating for my YouTube channel. You know how much I would love that. Um, 
maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's I don't know Tinder. You know, you can make a Tinder profile for my for my video uh, or my my YouTube. I wouldn't complain. Uh, I'm Joe Schmidt. This is the Majesty of Reason, and peace out.